Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. This is episode 181 of Whistlekick and Martial Arts Radio, and today we're bringing something very special for you. We have our first interview that doesn't involve me. Hanchi Bruce Jutnik, past guest on the show, interviewing Bill Superfoot Wallace, another past guest from the show. The two of them chat for just close to an hour, and it's completely amazing. I think you're going to love it, whether you're a fan of martial arts or of either, or hopefully, both of the two of them. You can check out the show notes for this episode at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out all the great products we've got at whistlekick.com. I don't want to burn any more of your time, but you get to the good stuff. So check out Hans G. Bruce Jutnik interviewing Bill Superfoot Wallace. We can go whenever you guys want. Oh, I have to look over that way? No, no, just So, so there's a lot. It would be natural. Be la- Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, I, what I'm going to do, I'll start off by telling everybody that's here what, what we're doing. <clears throat> you guys, um, this gentleman, uh, and I'm going to use this term, you're going to get upset, uh, Grandmaster Wallace, has done an awful lot in the martial arts. Okay, It's like a lot of times when you guys go out and you're going to study from somebody, you've got to know who they are. Not just who they are, but the things that they've done. Um, and like, for instance, in martial arts, now, a lot of this is going to be my opinion, okay? And, and he might hit me with a back fist and say, I'll oh, shut up. But, nope. uh, okay. but anyway, um, there are certain things that we do that we're not aware of the importance of things until later, okay? And then we go, wow, you know? It's like I think of all the stuff I've done in my life, and I go, wow, you know, that's kind of important now. And um, this guy here has fought probably the top fighters of all time, okay? And he has uh, uh, probably defeated most of them. And a lot of these personalities I know, some of the people I'm going to talk about, I knew personally. And it's, it's your jobs as students to find out these things. So let's say if uh, Mr. Wallace is someplace and he's teaching a seminar and he's coming out and he's doing this. You know, unfortunately, you got that internet, and a lot of that internet stuff isn't really good. But you want to look at them, and then you want to find out. And then you want to ask questions. Otherwise, all you're doing is learning a technique. Okay, you don't want to just do that. You want to understand what people, how they think, uh, what they've gone through, what they've done, and uh, have an appreciation for history. One thing I'm all about is I love history. I know the importance of it, okay? So what I'm going to do, and I think we had a discussion like this when we were in Texas. And yeah. And what was so funny is uh, uh, certain individuals were telling me, you know, I can't get him to talk, man. I just went, watch. Because his memory bank will kick in, and he'll start remembering. So I'm going to talk about uh, the things that he's done in the martial arts, the people he has uh, competed against, his views about them, and uh, what it means to him now. Now, for instance, too, how many, you guys think Bill Wallace has the fastest kicks in the world? No, he doesn't. You know what he's got? He knows the timing, and he knows the positioning, and he has the strategies because he's competed against some of the best. Say if his strategies weren't real good, and in the days when he was fighting tournament. And say, uh, he wouldn't have gone long. And people could have uh, really tagged him. He had to think. And he had a position. But the fighters I'm talking, I'm going to talk about were some of the best. And I'm going to bring up some names. I'll start right now. And, and if you would, uh, just tell me, geez, this guy was really good. He was really good at this. or was really good at that. And now the names that I bring up, a lot of these guys you've never heard of. Okay? I was talking to a student the other day about something... Uh, uh, I was doing it. Went, oh my God! You know that was the year I was born. I'm going, oh God, I'm sorry. So anyway, <clears throat> let's let's go back in time, and let's think about your studying because obviously a lot of people. Are, let me. I'll ask you guys. How many guys here think that Mr. Wallace is a Taekwondo practitioner? Well, you know how many right. people in the martial arts think that yeah. that's what he yeah. does. And your teacher was? Razor Shimabuku. And Shimabuku? Okinawan. And style? Shorinru. Shobayashi Shorinru. And who else did you know real well in the martial arts world that had the same teacher? Joe Lewis was at his school a year and a half before me. 
Okay, all right. Now, those of you guys don't know about Shimabuku, Shimabuku was a, a powerful man. He was a big shot and rule. And so Mr. Wallace, when he was came over to the United States, when you came over to the United States as far as teaching, yeah. how many practitioners do you think there were? Oh, I went to a, I, I, I studied in Okinawa for nine months. And I was late teaching, or I was late going in there because I was a judo player first. That's how I tore my knee up. But when I, I was, I made brand belt in, in Shimabuku school. Then came back to, um, to spend my last year in San Bernardino, worked at, where I worked out with Mickey Janek and George Torbett. Uh, Tony Janek, you might know George, Tony Janek, he was, he was an original practitioner too with, uh, Shimabuku. But anyway, uh, I came back here and went to a, went to a tournament, a Kempo tournament in, uh, Santa Ana, California. And there were probably, probably, with black belts and everybody there, maybe maybe a hundred people, all together. In the in the brown belt division, there were, I think I fought, I won my division. I think there were, I fought maybe fought three times. And brown belts is usually a huge division, right? And usually you fight eight, nine, ten times. But I fought three times, and this is 1967. Now, who is it? Yeah, once once you came over here and then you, you uh, Bill started in competition and stuff like that. How would you? Uh, okay, who did you go to then as far as study? Well, when I got out, of, when I started working with Mickey Jack and George Torbett, uh, I I got out of the service. My last year was in I was in the service Air Force between sixty three and sixty seven, June sixty seven. When I got out of the service in June sixty seven, I went back to Memphis, to. Uh, Indiana, Indiana to go to school, to go to Ball State University. Mm -hmm. I'm at Ball State University and I'm there and a friend of mine there says, hey, there's a bunch of karate people going to get together down in Indianapolis. Do you want to go? Sure, why not? So I go down there and that's where I met Glenn Keeney. Yeah. Now, Glenn Keeney, you probably don't know that much about him, but back in the late 60s and early 70s was a very, very smart individual. We used to train every day. We worked out every day together and we would have some of the dog beatness thing matches you had when we were in the dojo. We'd fight in a tournament, and everybody get up and leave <laughs> because it was boring. He knew what I was going to do, and I knew what he was going to do. So we'd just stand there and stare at each other for about 15 minutes before and, anybody and scored. what was his nickname? The Fox. Very intelligent, very sneaky. But we had, we had some great matches. I understand you just had dinner with him. We just did, right? yeah. We had a tournament in uh, Cleveland, Ohio called the, uh, well, Superfoot Nationals. <laughs> but uh, had about three or 400 people there. And uh, Glenn Keeney was a guest of honor. So you it guys, was a good scene. Glenn Keeney was, uh, just like when I was coming up in the yards, Glenn Keeney was called the Fox because he learned how to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he learned how to play the ring. Yeah, oh yeah. He was, uh, if he turned sideways and stuck out his tongue, he looked like a zipper. So, you know, you say, well, how's this guy going to hurt you? And where's belt right about here? So you go, I want him. Well, this guy put his fist about yay deep in your ribs when, you, when he did it. But he was a very, very intelligent fighter. He used the whole ring, get you to chase him, get you to run after him, and then all of a sudden he'd stop and you'd run into something. And it's like if you listen to my seminars, you know, I'm not a strong fighter, but just maybe I'm quicker than you are. So I'll get you to walk into something. And that's what Glenn was great at. Yeah, so you guys, you guys, if you have time, look up Glenn Keeney, uh, a great fighter. I'm going to bring some other fighters, and we'll just ask uh, Bill what he thought of them. Of course, we, you know, we'll we'll keep everything as cool as we can. Okay, I'll bring up some some of the people that I'm I'm very much aware of. Uh, Victor Moore. So <laughs> I, right. uh, Victor, back in the late '60s, early '70s, was a really, really good, 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 good tournament fighter, and uh, uh, we fought three times. I beat him two of the three. I fought him in a tournament in Denver, Colorado, and he beat me one point in overtime. But point matches, if you're familiar with point matches, anybody can win a point match. Anybody. Depends on the referees. Depends on what they want to look at, what they don't want to look at. So so I don't mind that at all. What, we, what upsets me about Victor Moore is he says uh, the top three fighters in the, in the country, which was Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis, and myself, he beat us all. Well, he beat me in a, in a tournament where it was a USK tournament that was pro Victor Moore, which is okay. I don't mind. I don't mind losing in a point tournament. Uh, he beat Joe Lewis when Joe Lewis was sick, and he beat Chuck Norris when he was. Uh, oh no, Scott, not Chuck Norris. Mike Stone. He fought Mike Stone in in California at the U.S. Team Championships, 
and Stone had already broken his ankle. So halfway through the match, Stone had to bow out. Well, you know, the disqualification or, or a forfeit. So in, in other words, he's right. I mean, you know, I can't deny that he beat the three of us. But it's how he beat us, you know. It's, it's kind of right back, and and it's some, you know, when you got to put in your resume, I beat this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. That that kind of denotes everything. I've never told everybody who I beat. It's my business. I remember it all right there, you know. Master Junkin and I were talking, and, and Hanchi, and just you know, just I remember everything. I gave every one of my trophies away. They're hard to dust. And so I can sit here and you can dab me, you'll know, talk to me about turn me to talk about Victor Moore. I feel I first time I fought, fought Victor Moore was at USK Grand Nationals in nineteen seventy. Now what what are the USK Grand Nationals? What were they? Uh it's a big huge, huge tournament. It's uh the United States Karate Association is very small now. But the the United States Karate Association Grand Nationals was a huge tournament, probably one of the top three tournaments in the country. You have the Internationals in Long Beach, California. You had the U.S. Championships in Dallas, Texas, and you had the U.S.K. Grand Nationals. And the U.S.K. Grand Nationals was in Anderson, Indiana at the time. And I stayed up all night partying, so I didn't care if I won or not. All I wanted was go back to bed. But I never got scored on that day, not one time, except for Joe Lewis in the Grand Championship match. He scored on me one time. Yeah, I, I got to bring this guy up because, you know, you, you know I, I, I had a connection with him, and, and I know you did. And I always I like the story that you told me about um, uh, why you sought this guy out and the job that you had, and that was Robert Trias. Yes, sir. I, uh, because of Glenn Kinney being my friend who was the United States Karate Association, mm -hmm. Robert Bowles, Parker Shelton, all these guys in the end were, were members of the United States Karate Association. So they said, Bill, why don't you join the association? So I said, okay. So uh, I, uh, I joined the association in 1969 and 1970. I apologize. I win the Grand Nationals. Uh, that summer, because I'm a college student, I say, I have nothing to do. I'll just go out to Phoenix, Arizona, where, where the United States Karate Association was, was headquartered. So I went down there, so I talked to Master Trius, and I said, well, I'll just come out and spend the, spend the, the summer out there. He says, okay, I'll get you a job. Sounds fun. I'll work during the day, work out at night, learn how to punch. because <laughs> I, I basically was a kicker. And uh, so, and Shory Rue, which is what Master Trius was, was a, a primarily a punching art. So I said, I'll go out there and spend the summer. So I get out there about the middle of June, and the job that they have waiting for me is null and void. So I go, uh-oh. So what am I going to do? Ah, well, I can turn around and go back to Indiana. And I said, no, it's nice out there. I like mountains. So I, so I said, well, I'll just look for a job someplace. So I look at the yellow pages, and... I find a place delivering ice. Now, understand, I've never been in Phoenix, Arizona in my life. They give me a truck. They give me a map. And they say, and, they, and the whole back of the truck is full of ice, you know, little bags of ice. So I have to deliver all, every one of these bags of ice, every one of them. And when I'm done delivering ice, I'm off work. I go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, pro probably 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm done. But... You know, Phoenix, Arizona, okay, luckily, it's built on a grid. So it's north, south, east, and west. So I got this map. I have to deliver so many pallets of, of ice to the 7-Eleven. Then I have to go to a Circle K. Then I have to go to a, a, a grocery store and a small place. And I'm all over the place. I'm driving. It took, but that's what I did all summer long. And it was not bad because, let's say I, I start at 7 o'clock in the morning. I learned from some friends that, you know, that did it. I buy a watermelon, I cut the watermelon in fourths, put the watermelon back on the ice. I drive all around till about 10 o'clock in the morning. I take my break, I eat the watermelon. Then I follow with the rest of the ice. But that's why, and then I worked out at night, went to tournaments uh, all over the place, and that's where we went up to Denver, and that's where Victor. Mm -hmm. Now you guys, you guys might not, you know, some of the people we're gonna talk about, you, you're probably not aware of, or who they were, but what's interesting about it, just like uh, Master Trias was, uh, really impressed me. Uh, his demeanor, his knowledge, his, his understanding of things. And he had the ability to, uh, and he had the ability, he probably knew everybody's everything at one time. But I remember Bob Bowles, you brought up uh, Robert Bowles, 
Robert Bowles uh, might come out to the gathering this year. I talked to him a little bit ago, and, and uh, I remember asking him about you, and I said, so, uh, yeah, you know, I said, I talked to Mr. Wallace. He was talking to uh, Bob about, uh, you know, uh, it's Hansi Bowles now. And he says, yeah, Bruce, he says, you know what, when we've heard, you know, uh, Bill Wallace was doing a lot of kicks, you know, old Okinawan stylus, you know, we didn't really kind of understand it, you know. And I said, so what'd you think? He said, oh, we were all chomping at the bit to get a hold of him. You know, we wanted to kind of show him one up, to beat him up. I said, how'd it go? He says, you know, Bruce, that son of a could kick. I said, what happened? Well, it didn't work out real well for us. But uh, he said, we, we love him to death. He's a great man. And there's another thing, too. You know, everybody in the martial arts has different viewpoints on what you do to train. Everybody had to do stuff, okay? Everybody had to do different things. And today, if you did it, you're going to get sued by yeah. other teachers, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure that he could tell every one of you how many different lawsuits you would have had against people like Trias and different people, right, for oh, yeah. the behavior. But there's a, a, a story that I, I Bob Bulls might have talked to me about that. Do you remember his baboon? Oh, yeah. Master so, yeah. <laughs> the good part of the bad part. <laughs> well, so he, he had a, he had a, a, a baboon or a, a chimpanzee in the back that he took care of. And every time, it was basically all of our pets. You go back there and talk to it, and it uh, it would let you know what it thought of you a couple times. It spit at you and all kinds of stuff. But it was it was kind of neat. He he loved it. Master Trius loved that little monkey monkey baboon or whatever the heck it was but we never knew what it was he would never tell us what it was but yeah it was his it was his pet he'd take it out and walk it around yeah. try to grab it try to tackle you oh come on pardon me just a second oh, being popular Hello, no. okay now, well, anyway guys I, I i know i don't know if this happened to you bill but bob Bowles was telling me that one thing that uh because I asked him, I said, tell me some trio stories that you remember. He says, oh, yeah, he had this stupid monkey. And the way we'd practice stance work, we'd have to do this line steps. And he put the, uh, he called our baboon, baboon on your shoulders. And if your head went up, the baboon would hit you. <laughs> now, how many of you guys would go through that with a, with a teacher? You really wouldn't, would you? Right? Again, you could get a lawsuit over that. Well, I guess what happened to the monkey, I guess it got loose and it killed the neighbor's boxer. Something dog. like that, yeah, something like that. And so he had to give it up to the zoo. But um, <clears throat> Robert Trias was very, very different. And this guy here, uh, him, uh, Lewis, how many different competitors did you remember that, that uh, oh. competed within the USK? Well, okay, Glenn, uh, Glenn Keeney, of mm -hmm. course, uh, Joe Lewis, Jim Harrison. Uh, when, I, when, I fought in the, when I fought in the Grand Nationals, uh, Jim Harrison was, was fighting, Victor Moore was fighting, uh, uh, the big uh, Ed Daniels, okay. uh, the big guy from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, God, what's his name? Kansas. What are you you're talking he, about? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I was thinking uh, of Demetrius Alanis. Oh no, he no. he's way too young. Yeah. Demetrius was way too young. He was. He started fighting when I was old. <laughs> but uh, had all the Ed Daniels, Skipper Mullins. Yeah. Uh, Roy Kerman, all these guys. Fred Wren, Freddie Wren. Now, you, you guys, what you don't understand, some of these fighters, they were all excellent fighters. I mean, if, you, if you're going to get hit or you're going to get kicked, they didn't mess around with it. They hit you. Now, I'm going to ask you some well, questions about but back Back in the old days, uh, if you ever look at some of the old magazines, it's like the golden era. Well, a point in the olden days was you, you didn't just have to see it. You had to hear it. And we didn't try to, but it just came out that way. If you threw a punch or a kick to the body, your whole goal was to drop the guy. Because if you didn't drop the guy, he was probably going to come back and take your face off. Because contact <laughs> was allowed. And if you got punched in the mouth, even if it bled, even if it bled, if you could continue, it was a point. It was a point. I remember one time Jim Harrison he was one of these guys, you know how you, you, you see fights and you, you say, I want that guy on my team? Well, Jim Harrison is one of those guys that you want on your team. You don't want him against you. He fought in a tournament in, in, uh, at uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, Billy Watson hit him with a punch. Put his nose over here. Yeah, most of us say the match is over. Go to the hospital, get your nose fixed. He laid down on the floor with the doctor, 
put two pencils up his nose and started jerking around and put it back in place and continued the fight. And I said, I think it's about time we go home. <laughs> I don't want that to happen to me. You know, because I, I started fighting back in, you know, where that was a point. Yeah. If I touched you, that was a point. I could have killed you. I, and yeah, I feel like I could have killed you. But those guys go about that deep in your ribs and go, how's that feel? Yeah, good shot. And that was a point. So, boo. I fought Skipper Mullins in Dallas in uh, 1972. And uh, I won the heavyweight division, if you can figure that out. And Skipper won the lightweight division. Now, Skipper was bigger and heavier than me. But it's Dallas, Texas. So he fought lightweight division. I fought the heavyweight division. I win my division. He wins his division. So we're fight fighting for the grand championship. And Ed Daniels is the head referee. Now, here's Ed Daniels. is a guy about 6'8", 300 pounds. One of the guys you look up at, I say, yes, sir. And it always ended with sir. And he says, Bill, look around at the referees. I look around at the referees. In one corner, there's Mike Stone. In the other corner, there's Chuck Norris. In one corner, there's Bob Wall. In the other corner, there's Pat Burleson. Now, all these guys are best friends. Best friends in the whole entire world. And this is 72 to where nobody really knew me except coming up, right? So Ed Daniels says, look around. I say, yes, sir. And he says, you know what you're going to have to do? You get a point, don't you? And I says, huh? He says, you're going to have to drop him. Now, um, oh, yeah, that's what I want to feel the point is. I don't want to have to have to hit somebody harder or worse yet, get hit. And I went, nope, yes, sir. So we bowed in. And the first thing that happened, he came across for bam, come turned across for try to treat me. Well, I stuck, stuck the hook kick up and ran dead into it. Down he goes. And I go, uh-oh. Uh-oh. And Chuck Norris goes, no point, hit him in the arm. So, okay, no problem. So you get up, and Skipper gets up and says, good shot, Bill. And I says, I, I didn't get anything for it. He says, what? I said, they said it hit your arm. And this is why... Skipper Mullins is one of my best friends in the whole world now. He takes his gi top, opens up later in a big old heel print right on his solar plexus. So I said, you know what? You can beat the crap out of me from now on. We're best friends. I don't care what happens now. And so we fought three rounds. I won in overtime. But, but it was like it was between Skipper and I who were the best kickers at the time. He scored with me, on me two back fists, and I scored a side kick, a hook kick, and a roundhouse kick to the head. So got lucky. Now, I'm going to throw some names at you, okay. and you tell me. I, I don't even know if you've competed against these guys or not, but you tell me what the uh, what the reputation was like. And the rest of you guys, what you want to do is try to remember this stuff. Now, believe it or not, tournament competition back then, a lot of people couldn't hang in there now. It was a war. Yeah, it was a war. It was a war. It really I mean, was. I remember when I was competing, your, your, your body shots, it was full contact. Yeah. You, yeah. you would you would fake the head shot, you know, and it, a lot of times if you hit them, you do this. And but we respected each other. We knew, we knew if, if Hunch and I were sparring and I hit him with a good shot, I said, it's coming back at me because it, it was just that much respect in it because, you know, there's no hang, you're no foot gear yet. It would just, here goes. So you tried. You know? I, have a, I have a very good friend right now that's very ill. And uh, I remember just working out with him once. That's Rick Alamany. You know Rick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. And um, I'll never forget, man, when Rick and I, one thing about Rick is that if you, you, uh, you tagged him, you know what you got? You got a big smile, and then you lost some ribs. And I got lucky with a, a nice roundhouse kick to Rick's head. And I was in my dojo, and he does this. He goes, I went, oh, God. He handed my ribs to me. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. Now, I'm going to throw some names out of people that I know you know of. I don't, like I said, I don't know if you competed. Well, this one guy I'm going to throw out right now, a Korean stylist. And I remember he could never beat Joe Lewis. And it used to frustrate him. I'm, sta I'm standing. I remember I was standing right behind Lewis, and, and uh, uh, his name was Byung Yu. Yep. And Byung Yu was at that tournament looking at Lewis and saying, I'm going to break your nose, Lewis. I'm going to break your nose. Lewis is uh, back in the day. You remember Honey and, uh, oh, yeah, sure. and Desiccated yep. Liver Tablets and that kind of thing? Oh, right? yeah. 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 So here's Lewis doing this stuff. He looks at Byung Yu and says, Very first shot, Lewis hits him with a back fist. Broke Byung Yu's nose. And, um, but these guys were something. So I'm going to throw some names. Byung Yu, what did you think of him? Did you tough, compete? Tough. I, fight, I fought Byung Yu twice at the U.S. Championships in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. But Byung Yu was very, very tough. As, as being a Korean system, a Korean style, he was a sixth degree black belt. 
Now, understand this is back in the early 70s, late 60s. There were no six-degree black belts, not Korean black belts, competing. There might be a couple out there teaching, but there were none competing. And you go, what's he doing competing? But he was young, and he worked very hard at it. Very, very good competitor. Very good competitor. But he was, you know, like he fought Joe Lewis. He did say, he tell Joe, he says, well, I don't know if he said he's going to break his nose, but he says he's going to beat him. Well, and they had a hell of a war, hell of a fight. Joe finally won, but, but they went at each other. I don't know, anybody familiar with Joe Lewis? Okay, well, Joe Lewis was about this wide at the shoulders, about this wide at the hips, weighed 205 pounds. And he, he, took, a, he took a stance, like my stance if you, from here, and you look down, you see these two golf balls on the end of his knuckles. And you go, shit, he's going to hit me with those things. Yeah. And he would. And he would. And, uh, you know, very, and very intimidated. Built good. I wanted to have sex with him. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, but built well, uh, very strong, handsome guy. And just, you know, the epitome of what we'd all want to be right. Tough competitor, uh, nice guy, good looking, built great, strong, fast, powerful. And he was just absolutely superb. But there's some guys out there that would not be intimidated by him. And Byung Yu was kind of one of them at the start. Yeah, Lewis had a body like a Vicks cough drop. Right? Yeah, yeah. And he was a very, very powerful guy. And, and, the, funny th and the funny thing is, he would take a size 2 kendo gi. Now, he'd wear a size 5 uniform, but he'd take a size 2 kendo gi and put it on. So he'd come up to there, and all you see these bulging forearms and these bulging muscles, and the top wouldn't come together, so his chest is sticking out too. And you look at him, you go, oh, shit, you know, because he, you just knew he was going to nail you. And he was, he was uh, very intimidating. Yep. So you got Bill you. Uh, and this, this gentleman's still around, and that's uh, uh, Steve Sanders. Oh, yeah, Steve Muhammad. Yep. I fought Steve uh, twice. The first time we fought in a Kempo tournament in Salt Lake City, Utah, it was uh, Mills Crenshaw. Remember Mills? Mm -hmm. Mills Crenshaw put it on. It was, uh, it was one of the first truly, truly nationwide tournaments that we had. You had to win a, uh, uh, an area. Well, I won the Midwest. Uh, a guy named uh, Steve won the, from the Southwest. Uh, uh, Artie Simmons, remember, won the Northeast, mm -hmm. but there were the, we were the there were like eight of us. There, Al DeCascos was in it, and uh, so uh, uh, Steve Sanders and I fought in that tournament. He scored he scored the first point with a with a back fist that, that you're kidding. He threw he threw something at me, <laughs> one of those things. So very fast, very fast, and I hit him with a roundhouse kick. And but hey, here's a guy, Ralph Castellanos. Oh, Ralph was a tough guy. He's a, uh, is he still at, at the, in He's Harris? still up in the Harris Club. Yeah, I want, I'm trying Club? to get him down the gather. Yeah, you, that'd be great. We used to call him the bear. Yeah, yeah. First, remember I told you about the first tournament I went to in Santa Ana? Ralph Castellano says, I met him there. Here's a guy wearing an entirely black uniform except for the Kempo patch. Got a beard. You ever see the pictures of, uh, in, in the magazines that were, uh, Count Dante, the guy from Chicago, with all the stuff with this, this thing here. Well, anyway, Ralph Costello's had his beard cut in a real beautiful angle. I, and everything was black. Arm pads were pads, shin pads were black. And I look at him and go, oh, because he looks like he would just look at you and kill you. He was a mean guy. Yeah. I remember bumping into him one time. I didn't know who he was. This is when I was first coming up and stuff in a tournament. I bumped into him and I, I go, watch it. He looks at me and grins. There's no teeth here. <laughs> yeah. I go, oh. That Just night kidding. he was fighting for grand championship against Alegria. Oh, okay, yeah. Alegria Ralph. hit him with a spin kick, full force in the head. Yeah, it's a good shot. Ralph went, I went, oh. Yeah. That guy was rough. Yeah. Rough boy. Um, Rich Callahan. Do you know who he was? I never, I never fought Rich. Oh, Rich. No. He was. He, Tall, lanky guy, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they called yeah. him the spider. Yeah. Uh, He's the, from California. The Cascos. Oh, Al Cascos. Al, Al and I fought probably four or five times yeah. uh, because we were both lightweights at the time. Well, I was the middle, but basically back then we were fighting. There were two divisions, lightweight and heavyweight. Uh, but I fought Ralph or I fought Al several, several, four or five times, like you said, in, and I was lucky because I had to reach on him. But he really top-notch competitor. He fought, uh, you guys don't remember Howard Jackson, yeah. but he fought Howard Jackson as the top 10 nationals in uh, – in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And Aldo Cascos hit him with a spinning back fist. 
and just knocked the crap out of him. You, see, you, know, you know what a chicken looks like? He didn't have a head that's walking around. That's what Howard was walking around like. <laughs> Caught him with a real good shot. You guys, these people, try to remember who some of these names are, and you've got to look them up because they, they, were all, they all had different personalities, yeah. man. These guys were all fantastic. Now, the Costco's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring up a good friend of yours, Ron Marchini. Yep. Now, what was Ron's strongest asset? He's very smart, very quick. Had a great reverse punch. Had a super reverse. Japanese top, but had a good sidekick. So you keep away from him. But a smart fighter. Smart fighter. Good sweeps, good takedowns. Uh, I was uh, when, uh, when I, I was in uh, uh, Dallas when he fought Skipper for the uh, team championship. And Skipper won the match. But for some reason, Skipper kept, Skipper kept falling on his head. And <laughs> Skipper and... and uh, Ron would just keep punching him when he's down. He'd take him down and punch him, but then Skipper would go, hey yeah, and get the point. So, you, you very, know, very tough, tough, you, tough, tough. You tough, know, tough. Marquini told me a story. I, 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 I want to share it with you guys. Marquini uh, uh, was a takedown artist, really was. I mean, you know, he'd, he'd yeah, uh, I mean, good sweeps, line up, sweep, take down, boom, punch. Well, anyway, the Costco's, I was talking to when I was in Hawaii, he was talking to me about Ron. He says, he says, you know, Bruce, he says, Ron, he says, so what'd you think of Ron? He says, oh, you, you know, I got to tell you, he says, when I fought Ron, he says, Bruce, that sucker was smart. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he came up to me before and he says, you know, he says, uh, Ali says, you know, we don't really use backfist, you know, with what I do. I don't know that uh, that much about backfist. Can you, can you kind of, I, I hope I, I get to understand what you're doing. So DeCosco says to me, he says, you know what the first thing Marquini did? I said, no, he, he said he bowed and he hit me with a backfist. And so... But you, all of these guys, these guys are very important that you guys try to understand who uh, who some of these people are. Okay, the most impressive fighter other than Joe that you know, g give me your, your three top guys that you had to compete against. Well, uh, again, Joe Lewis would be the Skipper Mullins, of course. Uh, and, you know, th there's another, uh, there's several guys right after that, but uh, Jeff Smith was tough. Howard Jackson. Um, um, it's a shame you couldn't know Howard Jackson before he got injured. From point A to point B is like that. Very, very it's quickest thing you've ever seen in your life. Just so fast. Because you get from point A to point B before you could defend, before you could react to it. He fought in a tournament in Denver, Colorado. Just to make some money. He's fighting in this event, a floor like the parquet over there. Somebody drops a paper cup. He's fighting and nobody picks up the paper cup. They it. Howard takes off, hits that paper cup with one of his one of his legs, tears every ligament in his knee. Every ligament in his knee. Medial clatter, lateral clatter, posterior and anterior cruciate ligament, just tears it to pieces. For all intents and purposes, Howard's career is done. Because now he can't get from point A to point B before you can react, because he's slow. He can't hyperextend. He can't extend the leg out because if he extends it, it hyperextends, pops out a joint. So he he can't do that. He, now back then there was no such thing as arthroscopic surgery. It was called exploratory. So he has to just let it heal. And uh, most of us will change, will modify, will play with it somehow to where we can make up for our mistakes. Well, if you can't get from point A to point B, what good is all the other stuff you're going to do? So all the punches and the kicks and everything that he did really good became basically null and void. So he was on our team in the first world championships, but he lost first round because he just get, couldn't get from point A to point B before the guy could counter. But if you could see him before that, he just so, so fast. He beat everybody. Beat Del, everybody. Delgado. Louis? <laughs> Louis was tough. He's a Shotokan fighter. Very traditional Shotokan fighter from New York City. He's one of few guys that fought Chuck Norris and knocked him out. He fought Chuck Norris in a tournament in New York, knocked him out with a spinning back kick. So tough, tough. He, too bad he's not with us anymore. Did you ever compete against Phil Conan? Yes, I did. Phil, I fought Phil uh, out of Casco. She used to have a tournament in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I fought Phil there. He was he was one with, uh, uh, who was the other guy? Owen, uh, Je not, not Bill Owens. Oh. Not Bill Owens, yeah, oh. Bill Owens. Yeah, and uh, was there, and and a couple a couple of the other guys, but they came in and Phil Conan fought. I fought Phil in that tournament. Yeah, Phil Conan was was something else, man. Yeah. I, I knew him personally. He was uh, uh, 
He fought, uh, well, I, I think he fought Norris as a brown belt. Probably. And he yeah. beat him. Really? Yeah, he beat, I think it was like three zip. You didn't know that? Yeah. You know? I'm glad I ran. <laughs> no, no Cor Corner was a scrapper. He was a scrapper. Yeah, tough guy. Uh, again, uh, you know, if you guys ever have a chance to look at any of these people, again, look them up. you got to learn this stuff, man. Um, all right, now I'm going to ask you some questions. You might not want to answer some of these, but but I'm going to because there's a I'll reason. Lie. Well, I know. No, no, there, there's a reason. And the, the thing about Mr. Wallace is Mr. Wallace knew how to read people as a fighter. He knew what to read. He knew how to see them, like they line up. And this is something you all, everybody has to learn. Like I said, it's not so much the way that you perform your kick. It's when you perform your kick. Timing and, and distance. And, yep. And when you're, uh, when you're working with somebody. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a, a name of somebody. Okay, here, here's a guy. Uh, first of all, talk about him for a second. And then we'll talk about how you have to line up with him if you did fight him. Uh, Thomas the Puppet. Tommy the Puppet is, is one of those guys you look up at. Shotokan player, uh, traditional Shotokan player. Uh, basically had a reverse punch. Primarily in competition, he used a reverse punch. Uh, very tall, lanky, but very, very smart. Fought, used to win all kinds of terms in the uh, New York area. And uh, just a, a top-notch fighter. Again, if you're going to throw a reverse punch, and we've all thrown them, the most important thing about that aspect is timing and distancing. Same thing with the kicking. If I'm going to throw a side kick or a rouse kick or a hook kick, I just can't throw it and hope it gets in. Most of us, when we spar, we spar by a method called throwing and hoping. Think about it. You get with a partner, you'll throw this. And you say, well, if he blocks this, I'll do this. And if he blocks this, I'll do this. Well, I never fought that way. I throw the technique. And if you block it, I understood and I watched how you blocked it. So if you block it, chances are I throw it again, you're going to block it the same way because the first time was successful. Now, if I fake it next time, you're probably going to block it the exact same way. Well, someplace else, there's an opening. And that's why I did what I do. That's why the three kicks that I work, the side, the round, the hook kick, come from all kinds of different angles, but primarily the same angle. I'll throw the roundhouse kick, but that turns right into a hook kick. And then it comes back into the roundhouse kick, and then the side kick comes underneath because that's the movement. And if, if that works like that for me, and I get you to block something, just for a second, you're open. All I have to do is find that opening, or better yet, we create it. Think about this. The very first combination you ever had was a back fist reverse punch. My very first combination that I ever threw was the back fist side kick. I don't want to. I don't want to face you this way because if I face you this way, straight like this, you're going to hit me. Look at everything that's open. But if I'm sideways, I can turn around and run. You know, a lot of times people ask me when I say I'll run from you. Hey, I'll back up in a heartbeat. I will back up in a heartbeat because that makes you chase me. And then when you chase me, I'll get you to walk into something. Okay, so now you're competing. Yep. So a guy gets on the, in, in the ring, he's going to come in. You know, you know who the fighter is. What is your first strategy that you're going to use against these guys? Now, I'm going to bring up the person first, okay? Okay. Uh, let's, take, uh, let's take Delgado. Okay. What would you do? So Luis Delgado is coming up. He's going he's gonna to compete. How would you right away set yourself up? Well, Louis, one of these fighters. Strict short the kind of player. So the first thing I would do is throw a really, really fast back fist at him. Really fast back fist. If nothing else, to make him back up. Or a low roundhouse kick to the lower tummy, right about here, to make him move the hands. Because primarily, Louis was either a reverse puncher or, like I said, a spinning back kick. So my job is not let you do that. If you can do that, you can score on me just as easy as I can score on you. So I'll throw that little roundhouse kick to the tummy fast so it's going to hit something. If it hit your hands, that means you got to keep there before you can counter punch. If I throw the back fist, you got to at least move your head. And if you move your head, you're not thinking about hitting me back right away. Because Delgado was a, a straight-in fighter. He would edge in, he'd move straight. He yeah. always going to move straight. He's not, a, he's not a backup artist. He's a move-forward guy. Okay, another guy comes in the ring. And he's gonna he's gonna compete against you. Uh, let's take. Uh, I'll just throw it out because we both. Oh, uh, did you ever did you ever fight uh, Pennington, Jerry? Jerry, no, sparred with him a couple of times, but never fought him. Uh, Pennington is a good fighter. Yeah. Right? Oh, Jerry's a good fighter. Got Jerry to... Pennington is one of those guys. How many of you throw front kicks? How many of you can throw a front kick with the ball of the foot? Okay, take your shoe off and bend your toes back. 
So in other words, the first thing that's going to hit is your toes. They'll give a little bit, then the ball of the foot might hit, right? So if I do that on those toes, you're going to walk funny for a while. Jerry Pennington could bend his toes back like this, bend them toes back, all the way back, so all you saw was the ball of the foot. And you go, oh, shit, because he could hit you with that thing through a great front kick. But that's what I remember about Jerry. Tough fighter, good point fighter, uh, good reverse puncher, good, good front kick artist, uh, very, very aggressive, big and aggressive. Yeah, you know, did you ever meet his one, uh, he had a female student, uh, Linda Puglisi? No. Oh, my God. Tough. I, oh, yeah. All, I, I, all, I, I all I remember is Janet Walgren, Har Harrison student. Okay. Do you, you remember uh, uh, the uh, Koshiki competition with a with helmet? Oh, that, no. Yeah, I, I remember it, but I, I, I... I ran a tournament for USK, and this was actually in L.A. It's after uh, uh, Sensei Trias died, and they were bringing the Koshiki in, the, the yeah, armor. Armor, armor, yeah. And we were trying to get fighters. And I, I tell this story all the time. Uh, and the guy that was going to fight was Anthony Newman. I, we had to get a fighter for him, just to, so yeah. he could try out the equipment. Well, anyway, this is full contact, guys. A bare knuckle. With no, a bare knuckle. A plastic face gear, full body armor, but you couldn't wear hand gear. Now, understand, you're going to punch a guy in the face that's got armor on. Head gear with a plastic face mask. And you can hit him as hard as you want. And you're going to hit him bare-fisted. It sounds like a bomb going not. off. You're not. You won't do that. You find out real quick. We found this out when, when the first time that, uh, that UFC happened. Because what happened in the first time, they, you couldn't wear gloves, you couldn't wear hand wraps, you couldn't wear anything. And when you're punching somebody dead in the face, and knowing that it's just your fist that's not protected, smashing somebody else in the face, you won't throw it as hard as you can. You just won't. Why? Because no. we've practiced. We've trained. We've, we've worked on control. Now, you girls are going to love this, okay? This guy, Anthony Newman, took the internationals that year in Long Beach, okay? Small guy, took lightweight division. And I'm trying to let these guys try out this armor. So what I did, we were trying to find a fighter for, uh, for Newman. And he says, you know, we don't have anybody at weight division. So this guy comes up to me and says, you need somebody to fight him? I says, yeah. He says, I, he says, I got somebody. I said, who? He says, my wife. I went, what? <laughs> so this little cute, petite, cute. You, you saw her, didn't you, Ryan? Puglisi comes up and goes, hi, sir. I'm gone. You know what we're doing. Oh, yes, I've, I've, I've tried this stuff. So she gets out there. They pair off. First punch, she knocks him out. Straight reverse punch. And it was beautifully done. It wasn't sloppy. It was boom. And I, I had to say this. I looked at her. I says, you know, I'm in love with you. You're beautiful. I says, who taught you? She says, Mr. Jerry Pennington, sir. Yeah. And that answered it. So you guys, Pennington is a fighter. He's a fighter. And uh, okay, so looks like a mountain man now. Yeah, looks like was, a mountain man. Yeah, he's a mountain man. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, uh, he just gave me a sign that we had to stop in five minutes. Really? Probably the uh, batteries oh. are going bad. Is the batteries? Is that what it is? What? How many minutes we got? Uh, we've got about five minutes. Or okay. Oh, okay. That's a right. lot of time. All right. All right. So, anyway, Jerry Pennington brought him up. Let me go over a couple other guys here. Uh, you get, uh, think of the person that you would be most worried about competing against, other than Joe. You'd have a good time with Joe. I, I, yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe's fighting system is absolutely perfect for my personality. Yeah. You know, because I'm having a good time type thing. He'd be, and I'd just be laughing the whole time. Just joking and laughing and having a great time. He'd, he'd grab, we fought, when we fought in the, in the Grand Nationals, I was through everything at him but the kitchen sink, everything but the kitchen sink. And it's just bouncing off, not doing anything, because he's a big, strong guy. Finally, I said, oh, what the hell? I turned right side forward, pulled in and swept him, and punched him in the chest. Before I pulled my hand back, he grabbed me and goes, <laughs> gim, 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 with that, but with perfect control. And I'm laughing and joking and having a wonderful time. He's pissed because I scored first, you know? And, uh, and, but that's just the way our friendship has gone since styles. day one. Styles. Yep. Systems. Okay. No, no systems. What systems that do not, that did not move back only went forward that you knew that. Shotokan. 
Shotokan's assistant to where they're here and they just move straight for. Uh, it, it's hard to get a, a Shotokan player to back up because their first thought is the counter with a reverse punch, front kick or reverse punch, front leg, front leg, front kick or a, a reverse punch, and basically either to the body or to the face. What about the old trios guys? Uh, I never had any problem with with, the, with those guys because they were so intent on punching that I knew they weren't going to kick. Uh, and if I know you're not going to kick, that's half your weapons. And and who who's in my seminar this morning? But a, anyway, if you're if you're facing in a, in a boxing type position or a karate type position, I know for a fact that you're not going to throw the front leg in a kick. Because number one, all your weight's on it. Number two, to throw a roundhouse kick, a front kick, or a hook kick, or a side kick, or a hook kick, you got to turn. You got to turn sideways. Speed, quickness. What's the snap? Uh, me. Uh, I, I always wanted to be. I always wanted to be quick. I. I. You know, I didn't want to be strong. I didn't care about being strong. I wanted to be fast. Uh, Kempo system was very quick. A lot of snappiness. Uh, the Koreans. A lot of they used a lot of power in their kicking techniques, toward, except towards the very end, where you got Mike Warren and those guys there that could really, really fast. Could hurt you if they had a hammer. Who are you more worried about as far as power between Taekwondo and Tong Sudo guys? Oh, Tong Sudo because they're more versatile. Yeah, they're, they're strong. Yeah. strong. And yeah. they and they have the punching. You know that the Tong Sudo people can punch, whereas the Taekwondo people will stay away from it. Uh, if you were going to give advice to these guys as far as learning about competition, would you have them? Just work with the way things are done today? Nope. Because it changes. Everything try changes. To, try to work old school. Everything changes. Every one of you are built differently. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. Different flexibilities. But most of all, we're different right here. I had a bad knee. That's why it's super foot, not super feet. And what happens is, when I started competing, I couldn't use this leg at all. Because I just got it out of a cast. So I had to Number one, protect it. That's why the, they, I'm in a side kick position or a side position from you. And I had to make sure that this whole side here, left side, left side, would work. I knew for a fact, and so did everybody else after a while, that nothing from the right side was going to come. Which made it even better because now that if you know it's not coming, you got to start guessing. You have to start guessing where I'm throwing the kick. And if I start the hook kick, you got to say, here comes a hook kick because it looks just like a hook kick. Then I can bring it back for the roundhouse kick. I can start the roundhouse kick. And trust me, it looks just like a roundhouse kick. And then it goes right into the hook kick. Now your hands are here. <laughs> there goes the side kick underneath. Benny Aquides. Benny's one of those guys that you want on your side again. Benny Aquides uh, was a point fighter. He wasn't a great point fighter, but he was a good point fighter. He was an absolutely fantastic kickboxer. Absolutely fantastic. The problem with Benny, who was a, one of, a great friend of mine, he didn't mind getting hit. And if you don't mind getting hit, you get hit a lot. And add, that adds up after a while. That adds up. But he's one of these guys, too. We did a movie together, not together, but with, with Jackie Chan. I did a protector with him. He did Meals on Wheels. And Jackie Chan wanted to spar with me. And I said, well, okay. So we spar around. I hit him with absolutely everything that I throw. And he says, well, I don't think I can beat you, but, but I think I could take Benny. And I said, what? He said, yeah, well, I sparred Benny, and I hit him with everything. And I said, okay, let me tell you something, Jackie. Benny's one of those guys that you can't hit. He just kind of invites that. But what you don't understand is one of these times you're going to throw that punch, you're going to throw that kick, and when you pull your hand or your foot back, he's still going to be on the end of it. He looks up at you and says, my turn. And trust me, you don't want it to be his turn because he's a tough son of a gun. Name, because you, I know you didn't compete against him, but name three of the top female competitors. Oh, well, Melinda Cascos was very, very yeah, tough. Melinda. Janet Walgren. And uh, you guys won't remember this, but she won the first uh, Taekwondo tournament, Arlene Lemus. Now, I, I, I don't want to leave out Linda Denley, but... She's at the same time Arlene fought, and Arlene beat her several times. So, But Arlene Lemus, tall, lanky girl, very, very fantastic kicker. Now, she's, she was a, a Lima Lama student, which is Kung Fu. 
she had to sue the United States Taekwondo Association to allow her to fight in the runoffs to fight in the uh, 1988 Olympics. Now, she knew also that she had to win by a big, big, big decision because they were going to do everything they could do to get, not let her win. But she beat everybody really seriously. And she won the Olympics. But Arlene Lemus, Linda, Linda Denley, uh, Al, uh, Malaya DeCascos, and Janet Walgren. Just tough. You know, the, uh, uh, this guy, Terry Dow, is uh, getting in our face. Yeah. He kicks from the wrong leg. Does he? Does yeah. he really? Yeah. That's why his new nickname is Terry Wrongfoot Dow. Okay. We're going to remember that. Well, you, you know what I call him. You ever see Fox News? Uh, no. This is my world. What's the guy's name? Come on, you guys. Jesse, uh, Jesse, Waters. Jesse Waters. Doesn't he kind of remind you of him? Yeah, you'll have to watch it sometime. Yeah, but, okay. but, anyway. if, but, if, but if you look at Terry Dow, look where his belt is. Now, <laughs> no, that, that's okay, but, but you know, he's like Skipper Mullins, unzipped his pants right about here. So it's all legs, you know, which is, which is terrible because all, he brings the leg up and it's all of a sudden in your face and everything else. You, you, can we get away? Get away anyway. you, you guys, I, I'm going to ask all of you a question. How many of you guys, you, you'll raise your hand or not, think that Mr. Wallace ought to do a lot of this stuff to explain more people that, that came out of history in the martial art and competitors and stuff. And I, I know a lot of you guys don't really understand this, but hey, this guy, he's competed against everybody, man. And he's been around the best. And he is one of the best. Well, you, you have to understand, too. Back in the early 60s, and, uh, you know, when we, when we started doing this, it was fun. It was just fun. You go to a tournament, you go to the old Japanese tournament. And you, you know, no show to come, but you go to a Japanese tournament, everybody lines up in a line. Everybody lines up in a line, right? No, no rank, nothing else, just everybody lines up in a line. The first two guys get up and fight. The winner stays, the loser goes home. And the, the guy that wins keeps, keeps playing as long as he wins. And you'll have a guy that wins the tournament by winning four matches. Then he'll lose. But it's the guy who wins the most, the guy that comes second place to win the most, and rank had nothing to do with it. You, you'd have a, a green belt and then fight a black belt. I remember Ray Dalkey. Remember Ray Dalkey? Mm -hmm. Ray Dalkey fought in a tournament in, uh, in San Bernardino. With uh, member Frank Smith, those guys. Yeah. But anyway, Ray Dalkey fought a, for the grand championship match, a green belt, barely won. Won it, won with a front kick. But you know, it, it was fun for us. We just had a good time, and that's what you need to do: is have a ball, have a blast. We're getting your whole a, life is we're getting been a hook. A hook is that is that is that a particular movement? <laughs> Sorry, they're throwing us out. These guys, are, I guess, got to teach. Anyway. I, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Hey, blame that on Terry, man. Yeah. It is Jeremy's fault. Oh, yeah. Those things are my fault. Oh, yeah. As it should be, because you're shorter.